Welcome to another CSEC English B video. Today we'll be blazing through the May June 2022 paper for CSEC English B. This will be a very quick video. That's because there are many repeat questions, many repeat passages. Entire sections of questions have been repeated on this paper. I will not be rereading or re-explaining anything I've done in past videos. I will link the videos in the video description that you can watch to actually see the explanations for the questions and answers that we've seen previously. So that means there are only two passages that I will be looking at in detail. Okay? Let's get started. So we've seen this passage before. I'll just be telling you what my answers are. And if you want the explanations, you can check the videos linked in the description for those explanations. Number one, C. Number two, D. Number three, A. Number four, C. Number five, D. Number six, C, seven, B, eight, D, nine, B, ten, D. So yeah, we've seen all of these questions before. The only difference is that a few of the options were kind of shuffled around, but same questions, same information, basically. Here we have another repeat question dealing with Mrs. Linda and Nora. So I'll just be reeling off my answers here. And if you haven't watched my previous videos, if you're not aware of my explanations for these answers, please watch those videos. It will not help you to just uh, memorize answers. You have to understand the explanations. Anyhow, 11, B, 12, D, 13, A, 14, B, 15, D, 16, B, 17, D, 18, C, 19, D, 20, C. We've arrived at yet another repeat question. Wow. This is why it is important to watch these past paper workthroughs. You will go into the exam and perhaps 60% of the paper is stuff you've already seen. Perhaps even more than 60% to be honest. So we have Hurricane Story 1903, 21C, 22A, 23B, 24 D, 25 B, 26 D, 27 B, 28 D, 29 C, 30 C. Nettles, finally, something to actually work through. This is a new poem. Pause here, read the poem two or three or even four times, if necessary, for yourself. I will not be reading the poem, so read it for yourself. And if you haven't already, attempt the questions on your own and then play the video. Here we have the poem on the left and the questions on the right. Number 31. The poem is mainly about a A. A protective father's response to his son falling on some nettles. This is what the poem is really about. We see here the son falls on some nettles, some thorns. In Jamaica we might call them makabush. And then we see that the father responds to this by going outside and you know slashing with fury the nettles so he got upset because he's protective of his young son who fell victim to these nettles the boy did not fall from the bed um, that's kind of a trick answer because they have nettle bed here but the bed here is just the flower bed 
not an actual bed that one sleeps in. The bee is out. The father did not react to the son being bitten by the insects here. We did not see the son playing with the nettles. Let's move on to 32. The poet puts bed, line 2, in inverted commas, right here, most likely because, answer B, it is used ironically since bed is associated with warmth and comfort. So my son, aged 3, fell in the nettle bed. Bed seems a curious name of those green spares. Bed, uh, curious here just means strange, weird, ironic. How can these spears be called a bed when they are not providing comfort and rest like beds are supposed to provide? They are the opposite of a bed. And so he is using bed in an ironic sense. Bed is not repeated for emphasis and it certainly does not reinforce any theme in this poem. There is nothing really special about bed besides the ironical usage. This is absolute stupidity right here. No real poet will use inverted commas just to capture your attention randomly. And D is actually the opposite of the correct answer. The use of the word is one that is normally associated with rest and sleep. Yes, but not, not this usage. This usage. This usage here is associated with pain, not rest and sleep. So while bed is normally associated with rest and sleep, the quotation marks here, the inverted comma here, is showing the opposite association of the word. Moving on to 33. In which of the following lines does a change occur? Answer C. And then I took my billhook, honed the blade. Line 9. Now let's look at lines 3, 4, 9, and 11, and basically try to justify any, any changes seen. My son, aged 3, fell into nettle bed. Bed seemed a curious name of those green spears, that regiment of spite behind the shed. So the regiment of spite here, we are not seeing a change. Why is there no change? Because the father is already describing the bed in a negative way, the, the nettles in a negative way. You see here, green spears. So regiment of spite isn't changing anything. Nothing is being introduced into the poem here. B purports it was no place of rest. Line 4. There is no change because we already see the ironical usage of bed to suggest that there is no rest involved here. We see green spears and we see regiment of spite. So nothing new is added here. What about the answer? C. What is the change here? And then I took my billhook, honed the blade. The change is in lines 1 through 8, the speaker is talking about the son's experience with the nettles. He's talking about the pain the son would have felt. The change is, now the speaker is about to take action. The speaker is about to do something about the nettles. We see that he takes a weapon in hand. He honed the blade, which means he's about to fight. So he's moving from talking about how evil and dangerous the nettles are to actually heading out to attack the nettles. Important change. And in line 10, he begins to slash the nettles. And so we cannot say that there's a change in line 11. Because, well, this would have been started from line 10. So line 9 is where we have a change. Moving on to 34. The poet's use of the regiment of spite in line 3 is effective primarily because it, answer C, gives the nettles the ability to take pleasure in inflicting pain. Now, when you see a word like primarily, especially in bolded font, what it suggests is there are multiple answers that could kind of work. However, there's one answer that's better than the rest. That's the answer we need to find. We know that the speaker is angry because of what the nettles have done to his son. The nettles are not human. They're not sentient beings that can actually hold a grudge and you know hurt people intentionally but because of how upset the father is he wants to project that ability to want to hurt someone onto the nettles he feels like the nettles are actually after his son and so he calls them that regiment of spite spite here being the keyword 
A does not make much sense compares the nettle's ability to be tall and dutiful even if the nettles could be as tall and dutiful as a regiment you know a regiment of soldiers the speaker is not considering the nettles as dutiful the speaker is instead considering the nettles to be evil malevolent villainous so using a positive word here to describe the nettles makes a wrong b personifies the shed and the nearby nettles as sharp spears now this sounds like it makes sense but it doesn't we do see some personification because we see regiment you know this is relating to humans soldiers however you can't personify something as being spears because bears are not human if it had said personifies the shed and nearby nettles as soldiers then that would have made more sense but it still wouldn't have been the primary reason for these words here so b is out and d is ridiculous because there is no calm or peace here 35 the best explanation of the expression he offered us a watery grin in line 8 is the answer b the boy is tearful he's crying but he wanted them to think that he was fine we see the grin which is the boy trying to act tough or appear okay and we see the watery which is talking about his tears we could say that the boy was crying and smiling but nothing indicates for how long the boy did not instantly dry his tears that is not stated at all and we do not know that the boy tried to get his father's attention that would be speculation 36 which of the following images is most dominant in the poem answer d military we see a lot of references to the military here um i might not find all of them right now but we have green spears spears weapons military war we see regiment again military language we see bill hook which is a weapon a military weapon and again the blade of the bill hook we see fierce parade parade is again military stood upright military funeral pyre military fallen dead like fallen soldiers dead soldiers military tall recruits military yeah that might be but there might be others now there is some nature in the poem obviously nettles nature however this cannot be the dominant um certainly not the most dominant image in the poem because we have so many military references and sound and color these are completely out a gets second place but of course we don't want the second place answer moving on to 37 which of the following best describes the structure of the poem okay this one's pretty easy d alternate rhyme what that means is we have a rhyme scheme that looks like a b a b a b a b if you have no idea what a rhyme scheme is well let's demonstrate on the actual point you have a we have bed then we have spears a different sound then you go back to a bed rhymes with shed back to a spears rhymes with tears b we call this alternate rhymes and as we go down the poem we see that this continues we have saw rhyming with raw skin rhyming with green blade parade it lit dead shed rain again and so we have this a b a b a b a b kind of structure which of the following is the most effective use of contrast in the poem so contrast we're looking at images or themes or words that are opposite and we have that in c the boy's tender skin and the sharp nettles we see a contrast between the tender skin okay, you can imagine the tender soft skin of a three-year-old and then the sharp nettles the sun does not contrast with the funeral pyre at all the crying boy and angry father are not in contrast in fact they are in tandem and the tall growing nettles do not contrast with the bill hook 39 
The speaker's tone can best be described as answer adversarial, which means the speaker is an adversary to the nettles or finds the nettles to be his enemy or his adversary. It's him versus the nettles. The father isn't just looking back on the good old days, so we can't say nostalgic. The father is definitely not apologizing to the nettles. And he doesn't seem to be apologizing to the son. And this is not a conversational poem. Last one here. Which of the following statements best sums up the idea in lines 14 to 15? So we see that after the father had destroyed the nettles, you know, with his bill hook, his sharpened blade, in only two weeks, they returned. What does this mean? It means we cannot always destroy the things that hurt us. This is another repeat passage, so you can pause, read, and attempt. I'll just be giving answers. Again, check the videos in the description to see explanations of these answers. 41A, 42D, 43A, 44D, 45B, Okay, let's pause here at 45. If you watched my breakdown of the 2018 paper, then you will remember me saying that we cannot say that the persona here is unloving. And I stand by that. The persona does show some love, not to people, definitely not to my Eunice. She does show love for the turtles. We can see that here. The speaker does talk about how she loves and cares for the turtles and stuff like that. So B here is not the answer that is most correct, but the answer that is least incorrect. It's just the only option we have. It's not a good answer. I think there's no good answer here, but B is the best we have. I suppose in defense of this answer, we could say that anti-hero means against the hero or someone who is in opposition to the hero and so since the narrator is unloving toward my Eunice who we might consider to be the actual hero then we could say unloving is justifiable here positive qualities cannot support your description of someone as an anti-heroine and because of that simple fact kind and forgives readily must be out of the question now as for c whether or not we could say that this can support um, the description of someone as an anti-heroine this persona is not easily led so it's out so we're left with unloving and i suppose c sec means unloving toward humans <laughs> or toward my unis 46 b 47 a oh, we've switched to blue 48 c 49 a and 50 c now we're on to smile the final passage and a new one Okay, 51. Miss Jonah's arrival reveals that the A. Mother had planned the narrator's departure unknown to her. We see here in the first paragraph that the speaker is confused about who this strange, this new lady is. But Mama is aware of what's happening. The meeting is obviously set up. And then Mama announces, Aisha, this is Miss Jonas. You're going to live with her. She wants a little girl who can jump around. Miss Jonah's arrival has nothing at all to do with whether or not the separation from her family had affected her. We don't know this. We can say that she perhaps gained some new insights, but this isn't very strong. There's no strong evidence for that. And sophisticated here is a very strange adjective for the narrator. The first person narrative used in the passage is effective most likely because it c captures the simplicity and authenticity of the child's distinctive voice and perspective we see a lot of language used throughout that really give us the perspective the point of view of a young you know just a, a child somewhat naive somewhat inexperienced 
somewhat wandering, somewhat confused. Reading through the story, we can see that there is no pretense, there is no fancy language, just a child being a child, thinking and speaking as a child. 53. What literary devices are used in the statement? The sun was setting bright yellow like when the storm was going to come. This is D, simile and foreshadowing. So we have the simile here as we have um, two things being compared with as or like. In this case we have like. But where is the foreshadowing? The foreshadowing is in the coming storm, which is actually representing the difficulties and the pain that the narrator would suffer being separated from her family. And these are all just not correct. Nothing to argue there. 54. The effect of the change of setting from the narrator's home to Miss Jonas's house and later the narrator's new school and church is that it has to be A. It emphasizes the contrast between the narrator's past and present social environment. We see the contrast as we look at the first section here where we see the girl in the previous setting, Mama's house, but then we see that her environment changes completely when she moves in with Miss Jonas. Now she's going to a big fancy school, a big fancy church, the house is big, she's eating you know, much bigger meals and stuff like that. So we see a stark difference between the two different lives. There's no indication of any internal change happening or, or anything internally changing on a daily basis. Uh, there's not much symbolism in these places and the places wouldn't only create an atmosphere of despair because we know that she was not feeling any despair when she was in Mama's house. And while the narrator might be a strong, versatile character who can survive many things, the effect of the change of setting does not point to this. So sometimes CSEC will trip you up by giving you an answer that sounds true but that does not necessarily relate to the question being asked. Where's 55? What inferences can be made about the older sisters during the narrator's first encounter with Miss Jonas when the sisters form a circle around her? Lines 17, 18. So this Miss Jonas person is coming to abduct, to take away, and, you know, steal this little girl and her sisters form a circle around her. This clearly indicate that they're protective of their little sister, and they're prepared to defend her. 56. The effect of the sentence is, I vex with my mother. I grudge my sisters who get to stay. I feel like the God who I say my prayers to every night betrays me. Lines 20 to 21 is that. Answer A. Their increasing length parallels the narrator's rising tension and rage. Now, this one's a little complex, but it's the only option that makes sense. So looking at the length, Looking at the lengths of the sentences, we see a short one gets a little longer here, gets even longer here. So we can imagine that as the sentences are getting longer and longer, the speaker is feeling a more intense emotion as she contemplates, as, as she thinks of where her life is and how betrayed and how alone she feels. We do not really see colloquial terms and any local flavor coming out here. I mean, saying I vex with my mother could be a little bit colloquial, but that's not very important. And it's not really adding any local flavor of such. And um, distrust is not a word we could really use here. We're not seeing where the narrator is distrusting of her sisters. Maybe she doesn't trust her mother because her mother kind of sold her out, but she grudges her sisters. She doesn't distrust them. And... She doesn't necessarily distrust their religious beliefs. It's just that she distrusts God. That's a little bit different. And D is definitely out. There's no improvements happening here. 57. Which of the following words best describe the narrator's mother? Answer B. Practical, realistic, and decisive. Practical and realistic because the mother realizes that she simply can't take care of all of these kids. Miss Jonas wants a girl who can jump around. I have a girl who can jump around and who I can't take care of. So let me send her to live with this rich woman. Practical. Realistic. She's decisive because she makes up her mind that her daughter is going and she doesn't 
fault or she doesn't seem to think twice about it. The mother just drops the news very decisively. Aisha, this is Miss Jonas. You're going to live with her. That's it. We're not seeing where the mother is polite, respectful and sensitive. Definitely not sensitive towards her daughter. Perhaps respectful toward Miss Jonas. Uh, polite? Uh, I'm not sure. But yeah, A is a pretty weak answer. Agreeable, friendly and emotional. We're not seeing where the mother is emotional. She's very practical but not necessarily emotional. Friendly? Uh, maybe towards Miss Jonas. Agreeable? Well, not necessarily agreeable to her daughter. Impassive meaning not really showing much emotion. Yeah, we could say that. Critical? We're not seeing her criticize anyone per se. And while she's pretty decisive and uh, almost cold, I wouldn't say that she is necessarily domineering. Okay, 58. Which technique is used most successfully by the writer to convey the narrator's criticism of Miss Jonas's church activities and rituals? This one is A, humor. We see here a humorous description of what church is like. The singing dead, no tambourine, not shaking, nobody moving. And as we continue, we see a humorous description of how boring, how bland the church service is. And then look here, sometimes the parson sing the prayers, but in a kind of singing that you're not sure is really a song. Sort of how like when a ram goat ball, when him know him going to ball whole night till them let him go. Yeah, so we see humor. And we just don't see any of these. 59. Which of the following statements best describes the theme of this passage? A. Different priorities often motivate the contrasting experiences of children and adults. We see this as we look at the little girl and her mother. The mother's priority is basically being able to finance her home properly, being able to take care of her family members, which means getting rid of one of them essentially. While the narrator would rather stay at home if it even means living a poorer life but at least she would get to be with her family, be with her sisters. And so we see where Mama and Miss Jonas, they have very different priorities from the narrator and that is what creates this contrast of experiences. We see here that B is actually not a bad answer. The unpredictability of childhood is driven solely by the whims and fancy of adults. Now to say whims and fancy is uh this term is is not one I would I would use. It sounds as if the adults are just saying and doing whatever they please with no reason just to mess up the children's lives. But we see where there is some amount of reasoning and, and logic behind sending this little girl away to live with Miss Jonas. Also solely this word is just too strong. And these two are out. Okay, 60. The dominant emotion evoked in the reader by the final two sentences in the passage is... So as we read these last two sentences, what do we feel? I never understand why it's me she take. And I never understand why mama agreed to give me away. So this is a tricky one. I actually went back and forth between B and C on this one. A is a weak answer, but it's not as bad as D. So looking at the last two lines, we have to ask ourselves, what am I supposed to feel as the reader? And C might sound good, perplexity, but we need to keep in mind that the narrator, the speaker, is the one who is perplexed here. But what is the emotion that we should feel? I think we should be feeling empathy toward the speaker. These lines show the perplexity of the narrator, but they are trying to instill in us a feeling of empathy where we are trying to understand how she's feeling, put herself in her shoes and also sympathize with her. So empathy slash sympathy. I'm not seeing where anger is being evoked per se and the perplexity is more on the side of the speaker than the reader and this interest is completely out. Okay, so that's it. Those are my answers for the 2022 paper for May-June for English B. See you soon.